Stanford University. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone here this afternoon for this very special event. Uh, I want to acknowledge the Stanford Historical Society because it was the Stanford Historical Society whose idea this was. They reached out to us and asked if we could partner on this, and we were more than willing to do so. And based on the crowd here today, uh, they had a capital idea. I want to particularly thank Charlie Yunkerman, whose idea this was to bring us together and for all that he did to make this um, a reality, as well as everyone else who was involved. The topic of history is interesting at Stanford. We're a young university. We're only 120 years old, and I think partly because we're so young, we seem to be a little bit obsessed with our history. And I know this because we do a lot of evaluations of Stanford Magazine, and the one story most popular in the last 10 years, a history story, who killed Jane Stanford. Now, there's a little bit of extra intrigue there beyond just the history nature of that. Um, but when you look at these other stories, the track meet in the 60s between the US and the Soviet Union, or the, the article that we did last year on Lake Log, or the most recent article on Frost, when it really rocked, these are all articles that resonate with our alums who love our history. And so what better topic today than what this panel has brought to us? We're so pleased they could be here. It's now my pleasure to introduce the man that will introduce the panel, not that we're too bureaucratic around here. Um, most of you know Norm Robinson. If you don't, um, it's amazing. He has led um, 45 trips for Stanford travel, so you may have met him there. He was a PhD student in his, in his, at the School of Education here at Stanford. Uh, some of you know him from his uh, nonprofit work. I know him because he's the guy who tried to put all the fraternities out of business when I was here in the 70s, so he has a special place in my heart. I've known Norm for years. Uh, he's a wonderful human being and one of the newest members of the Stanford Historical Society's Board of Directors. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Norm Robinson. Wow, I didn't know that topic was going to come up this afternoon. <laughs> uh, well, I am delighted to add the welcome of the Stanford Historical Society because this is a co-sponsored event. You get two of everything, two welcomes, two thank yous. Um, and I think you will appreciate why at the end of today's presentation. Uh, we have a terrific program for you this afternoon on women at Stanford during World War II. And it's, it's not a repeat um, of the program that took place two years ago, but we have a lot of the same panelists. So we are really fortunate to be able to have this program here on the campus. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator, Professor Estelle Friedman, and she will then introduce all of the panelists to you. Uh, Professor Friedman is the Edgar E. Robinson Professor in United States History. Before coming to Stanford, she did her studying at Columbia University, getting a BA at Barnard College in U.S. History, and then a PhD from Columbia. In 1976, Professor Friedman arrived on the Stanford campus, and she has been teaching courses in U.S. women's history and inter interdisciplinary feminist studies ever since then. She is also a founder and former director of the Stanford Program in Feminist Studies. Professor Friedman has written numerous books, too many to, to uh, recount here, but I can tell you that two of them are No Turning Back, The History of Feminism and the Future of Women, that was in 2002, and Feminism, Sexuality and Politics, 2006. She's also written two books on women's prison reform and edited journals, and uh, there are other publications. Um, Professor Friedman is also the recipient of numerous awards acknowledging how gifted a scholar, teacher, and mentor she has been uh, during her career here at Stanford. And the recognition comes not just from Stanford, but also from sources outside. At Stanford, Professor Friedman has won the Dean's Award, the Dinkelspiel Award, the Rhodes Prize, and the Kahn Van Slyke Teaching and Mentoring Awards. She is the recipient of the Nancy Lyman Relker Mentorship Award for graduate training from the American Historical Association. And most recently, Professor Friedman was just honored with an award of a Guggenheim Fellowship to complete a book entitled Redefining Rape, 
Gender, Race, and the Politics of Sexual Violence in America, 1870 to 1930. So please join me in welcoming Professor Estelle Friedman, who will introduce our panelists and lead today's discussion. Thank you very much. It's quite an honor to be asked to serve as the chair of this panel today, and it's a wonderful opportunity to meet the terrific panelists who I've had a chance to spend a little time with uh, this afternoon. I want to especially welcome the uh, Stanford alums and the students from my modern U.S. women's history class who are intermingled among you here today. Um, my goal for our panel is to elicit history from a personal perspective, to raise some questions that will allow our panelists to take you back to the 1940s at Stanford, in the nation, and in the world. But first, as promised, I'm going to very briefly introduce each of our panelists. You'll be learning a lot more about their lives momentarily. Then I'm going to facilitate the discussion by raising a series of questions, moving as historians tend to do through time, and giving everybody a chance who wants to answer each of those questions as a kind of a, a round table rather than individual speakers. And we're going to leave time at the end for those of you who want to ask questions or make comments. Mm -hmm. Our panelists then, in the order in which they came to Stanford. First, to my immediate right is Janet McClanahan Morris, who is originally from the peninsula, who came to Stanford in 1941, overlapping almost entirely with the war years. Her own war work ranged from rolling bandages to patrolling the coast from the air. She was the first female president of student government at Stanford, and after graduation, she raised a family, traveled, and later served as a trustee of the Peninsula Open Space Trust. And I'm only telling the bare details here. You'll learn more. Next, Merlon Albrecht Howard Williamson left Oregon for Stanford in 1942. She worked as a nurse's aide while she was a student. She graduated in 1946. Merlon majored in international economics and worked as an export, in an export-import company. Later, she volunteered at the Oakland Museum and has worked in historical preservation. Chronologically next, we have Marie Wagner Krenz from San Francisco, who was at Stanford from 1943 to 1948. She earned both her undergraduate and her MA degrees here. She was a president of Robley Hall, she knew a thing or two about rolling bandages as well. And she taught Spanish to returning vets. Later, Marie became a teacher and a freelance writer. Next to her is Babs Waugh, who came from Pasadena and arrived at Stanford in 1944. Did I go in the right order here? Yes. Uh, she majored in biology, worked as a lab assistant, and was active in student government. After graduation, she studied medicine, raised a family in California, and then, as she tells it, in the 60s, she got restless and began doing cardiovascular research in San Francisco and then ran programs in high schools and for adult literacy. And our youngest alum on the panel is Jean Rogers Moffitt, who arrived in 1946 from Southern California after the war. She was active in campus government, participated in modern dance as well, and after graduating with an education degree, she taught for five years and then studied interior design, and she has had a design business for 30 years or more. So I'm, uh, as I say, very honored to get to know these women who were part of, as we were talking about before, a really historic generation um, and in fact, one of the things that I want to start out in our first round of giving you a sense of who they were and the moment in history when they came to Stanford in the early and mid-1940s. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit uh, about what brought you to higher education? What brought you to Stanford? Were you the first in your family to go to college? Were you the first woman in your family to go to college? Um, what did you think you were going to get out of college when in the early and mid 40s you came to Stanford? And is there anybody who wants to, um, should we just go down the row very briefly with how you got here and what you thought was going to happen here? 
Do you want to start us off, Janet? I'll be, I'll be quick. I went to Burlingame High School, so I was nearby. And at that point, Stanford had a, a very wonderful education, even though it was called the farm. We, we, knew, we knew what it meant. And I was the first in the family, yes, to go to uh, college. Mm -hmm. Neither my parents uh, went uh, mm -hmm. to uh, university. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was interested in Stanford because it was of its reputation and the fact that I hoped to go into uh, international, uh, some sort of international, working for the State Department and so forth. Merlon. Well, I, on the other hand, um, came to Stanford not as my first choice. I had grown up in Oregon, and I wanted to go to the University of Oregon, where all my friends were going. But my parents determined that this was the place I should go. Oh. I'm forever grateful for that. <laughs> and my mother also had never gone to college. Uh, my mother had not gone to college. My father, yes, he was an engineer. I never really thought about college. I just knew I'd be going. My brother went to Stanford, my older brother, and I just followed along because it seemed the natural thing to do. And I'm delighted that I did and uh, had a wonderful education and a wonderful time. Well, Stanford was part of our family, practically. And uh, my father was a graduate of Stanford, uh, had aunts and uncles, and even a great uncle. And uh, my mother went to, went to Berkeley, you see. So they had a lot of fun. <laughs> but it never occurred to me to go anywhere but Stanford. And so I went to Stanford, and I had my whole entire life worked out when I, when I arrived. I would major in pre-med and, and uh, biology and go to medical school and maybe get married, have children. It was a little fuzzy. It got to be a little fuzzy at that point. Well, I was programmed from the time I was three years old. What are you going to do when you grow up, Jeannie? <laughs> I'm going to Stanford. <laughs> I didn't know what that was. <laughs> I didn't know where it was. I mean, I had no idea. And finally, uh, I decided, uh, as a senior in high school, that maybe Stanford didn't know I was coming. <laughs> I better apply to UCLA. I grew up in Southern California. And, but my mother kept you know, saying, you've got to go to Stanford. So I got off the train, never having seen the campus, not knowing where I was going, what I was doing. And I was very reluctant to leave four years later. <laughs> it was a wonderful decision on my family's part. We were talking earlier about what was it like before the war and what was it like during the war, but since our panelists really came during or after the war, we just have to sort of imagine Stanford before the war, what it was like. We do know that there was a quota on women students, that no more than, I believe, 30% of the student body could be female. And we were talking about what it was like during the war and how things changed. So I'll just open up to anybody who wants to start off talking about what it was like to be a student at Stanford during World War II. And, and Alexi, let's start with the basic historical question you must always get asked. Where were you during Pearl Harbor? What did you feel? Were you already at campus? Were you not yet here? What were your feelings about how this was going to affect your life? Is there anybody who wants to speak to that very popular question? I you want to start us off? Yes. We lived in San Francisco, and I was still at Lowell High School. And I remember that Sunday when someone called to say that, that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. Um, I uh, remember that I was a senior when my brother, who was at Stanford, had been drafted. And in those days, uh, we didn't know it yet. In those days, girls wore boys' sweaters, and I used to wear his sweaters when he'd let me. And I remember the day he came up our st stairs in San Francisco, took off his sweater, and handed it to me. He said, I've been drafted. Did you want to speak, Janet? I, I was uh, at Stanford as a freshman when Stanford was still Stanford, just before her Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And I uh, remember the day very clearly because my parents lived in Hillsborough and I'd gone home 
probably to pick up laundry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we were living in Robley, and uh, it made a huge difference in our lives because we knew what a serious uh, occasion it was. Uh, at that fall, Stanford was celebrating its 50th anniversary. So now we're beyond the hundredth. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a lot of things have changed. Mm -hmm. And we knew as students that our lives would be different. Did anybody else want to speak to the Pearl Harbor question? Merlon, did you? Well, I, went, I, I too had not started Stanford. And I remember it was a Sunday around 12 o'clock. And we were driving home from church and had the car radio on. And it was incomprehensible. We couldn't believe it. And kind of a pall fell on everything. Well, I was in Southern California. Uh, and I remember the day very, very definitely. And I remember that the few days afterwards, when we were afraid that, there were, that we were going to be invaded. I don't know whether that was true in Northern California or not, but it was true in Southern California. And, of course, everybody had blackout curtains, and we got used to that. I remember not being afraid after a week or so. Do you want to talk and speak to that, Jean, or? Okay, sure. <clears throat> so what was it like to be at Stanford during wartime? What was it like to be a student, a college student? What was different about the student body, men and women, classes, your concerns in the world. And I'm just going to throw it open to whoever wants to start us off whenever you were here, anybody who was here during the war. Well, I do remember very clearly in Robley Hall that we too were afraid of uh, air raids. There apparently had been some Japanese submarines on the coast of, of uh, Oregon. And so we had air raid drills. and. Uh, down in the basement of Roble, everyone would assemble, and then we'd all just sit there and talk, and there was a little place down there where you could buy food, things like chips and what have you. So we sat on the floor down there, and what if, and what would be like, and talked about the war. Mm. I was in a sorority, and we studied in the closets because we didn't have what you had in Robley, but the minute there was an air raid siren, there were drapes, blackout curtains. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had, in order to study, we would get our flashlights, go in a closet, and mm -hmm. two or three of us kind of scrunched in there, tried to study for our finals. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that uh, we knew that this was something that we had to persevere with as students, even though it was hard. Uh, we had our education to go ahead with, and most of us accepted it and tried to overcome the difficulties, which in our cases were minor compared to the rest of the world. Anyone down at that end of the table? You're a little later. So um, we were talking earlier about the the sex ratio, we're thinking like, well, it's the war, and the men have gone, and it's just women left here. But in fact, that wasn't really the case, was it? What was it like, say, in the early war and then later in the war in terms of um, being a woman student and uh, the issue of men going off to war? Well, it was somewhat of, of the case. Yeah. Um, I arrived in 1944, and uh, my mother came up to visit at the time of gaieties, and I don't remember wh whether that was fall or spring, but she was a little bit shocked by the, um, and all the skits were about the lack of men. <laughs> okay. She didn't ever use the word sex, but that's what she meant. <laughs> So there was that feeling that, uh, that the, the ratio was, 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 was against us. <laughs> but we all had our eyes on the hashers. <laughs> Some of the few men around. And, and one of the most fun things, if you had a birthday, your friends would arrange for you to have a special cake and a kiss from your favorite hasher. <laughs> I see everybody else seems to know what a hasher is, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the server? That the, reminds the, me of a yeah. very funny story. In our house, 
Uh, the son of Warden Duffy was one of our hatchers. Perhaps you remember Warden Duffy was the famous head of San Quentin. But at any rate, his son we called Lover Duffy because he could really kiss. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else you remember about social life that you'd like to share? Uh, well, this was in serving the cake, you understand. Uh, the ah, <laughs> thank you. That's great. That's great. Um, one way we contributed, you probably remember some of you, the war board, and that was our way of trying to help our country. Yeah. And we gathered tomatoes. Believe me or not, the farmers needed workers, so the women, going from Robley in a truck, went mm -hmm. out to the farmyards and we couldn't look at ketchup for a long time because <laughs> well, but we also uh, gathered by knocking on the trees walnuts and almonds the tomato gathering didn't last too long because the uh, toilet facilities were rather uh, mm -hmm. barbaric and the parents of the girls who went out said to Stanford no more tomato picking <laughs> Well, that kind of leads to another area. We can come back to social life and classes, but the whole issue of war work. And we know that women were mobilized in the nation to work in war industries and to buy war bonds and to really serve the patriotic cause. Did you feel, for those of you who were at Stanford at any time during the war, um, called upon to, in addition to agricultural labor, do other kinds of work? I know some of you did um, to um, help the war we helped with the Red Cross. We helped with bond drives. We helped with uh, blood donations. Mm -hmm. And we said rolling bandages. Mm -hmm. They also had a course on nurses' aides. And most of us uh, served as nurses', nurses aides, aides throughout the war, wherever we lived. When I was doing my stint with nurses' aides, I, it was the old, uh, the old hospital down at the foot of Palm Drive. And um, we would go down early in the morning on our bicycles. Nobody had a car. You know, you only had three gallons of a C coupon with three gallons of gas. And um, when you'd get there, you'd look and see where you were going to be serving that day. And we all wanted to be on the maternity ward. And by golly, we were all with the geriatrics like we are now. <laughs> <laughs> Marie, were you going to add something? I'm going to say, I think we were all encouraged to do some type of war work, and we did. And we had, I remember as a, a freshman, hearing among the choices would be that we could work in a nursery in Palo Alto. And I thought, neat babies, I love them. I never really held one, knew nothing about them. <laughs> but then they said, now first of all, you must, when you arrive, you will go in, the babies are just waking up, and you'll find that they're all wet. And that was the end of it for me. I did, <laughs> I, I did not want to do the nursery, so I turned to bandage rolling, and I, I, I had the job on board board of staffing the uh, room for bandage rolling. Well, I wish I could think of what I did, but I can't. <laughs> I don't well, think I did anything. Well, I just want to, can I probe, Janet, could you talk a little bit about patrolling the coast? Yes, well, this is very strange, well. but I had a pilot's license, and the only way to keep your hours up was to uh, join the, or and was happy to be a member of the Stanford Flying Club, because private flying was not allowed on the coast. Uh, we had a couple of Piper Cubs down at the Palo Alto Airport, and believe it or not, we were supposed to patrol the coast from about Mendocino to Big Sur, looking for Japanese submarines. Well, you can imagine there were three women in the Stanford Flying Club. We weren't able to get many hours because the men in the club wanted to get their hours because they were anxious to join the Army Air Corps or the Naval Air Corps at Moffett Field. Of course, we didn't ever see a Japanese submarine. We could only go about 90 miles an hour in those Piper Cubs, but uh, as someone mentioned earlier, a Japanese submarine did shell the Oregon coast, 
And uh, 12 miles north of Santa Barbara in 1942, a Japanese submarine shelled an oil refinery with no damage. But it wasn't, I don't remember hearing much about it myself when we were at Stanford, but it was publicized in a magazine called Parade. Mm -hmm. And the, the sub went off the coast watching to see how much damage was done, which was nothing. <clears throat> and that, I think, was the end of the Japanese submarine invasion. invasion. So um, on this issue, is there anybody else who wanted to add war work or feeling patriotic during the war? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Any other comments about patriotism, war work, contributing to the war? You were a mere child, Jean. Well, remember, I got here when the war was over. Right, that's what I was thinking. You were too young for that. But, but um, did any of you ever think of joining the armed services, either during or after college, especially because women were being mobilized into the services for the first time? Or did anybody in any of your families, any women, serve? What I remember is that the men did not talk about the war. They did not want to discuss it. It was over, and they were on their way to an education and a new life. And very, very seldom did anybody discuss the war. Mm -hmm. It was there were past. Several Stanford women so of course that was pretty ways. nice for all of us. So this is, and I want to get back to that in just a second when we get to the post-war, but um, Janet just recalled, do you want to mention? I, I'm sorry to say I don't have their names, but there was a uh, woman who entered the waves and became quite uh, well known. and and a established student. yourself, yes. Uh -huh. uh, I don't remember that there was anyone who joined the WAX, uh -huh. but definitely the WAVES. Uh -huh. And I was interested in joining the, the women's ferry. It, it, the, we ferried The planes. WASPs. Uh, pardon? They were called the WASPs. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I got married. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which Did was, you keep uh, up your flying later? Uh, I flew when I worked in Washington, D.C. for a, a, a year. Mm -hmm. I could fly there because it was in the interior. Mm -hmm. Then after I was married, the exchequer didn't allow my flying hours. Too I expensive. See. Okay. Well, is there anything else anybody wants to say about Stanford during the war before we let the vets come back onto campus, which is a whole other story, but anything about social life, academic life, um, we were talking earlier about the fact that uh, there was a sense that the men were gone, but um, well, perhaps one, not I, all of well, them. Well, one thing that yeah. there was a lot going on. Uh, first of all, there was the daily trip to the post office. To all, the, everybody was corresponding with people who were in the war, mm -hmm. and their brothers and friends, and and so every day you'd see everybody down at the post office getting their letters. And the other thing was, without there being any men here, women uh, took a big interest in intramural activities. I remember that our, my living group had a very fine basketball team. I can say that because I wasn't on it. But I would go to the practices sometime. And my living group was Delta Gamma. And big game was the basketball game between the Kappas and the DGs. And the Hashers could, wait, could were you, the young um, leaders. Could you explain what you just said the, between the campus and the? Delta Gammas. The Delta Gammas, thank you. Okay. So between the Kappa, the, Kappa Gammas. Kappas gammas and the, thank and you. And the Delta Gammas. Those were sororities. Thank you. And they later became Coverly and Party Story. And the, the rivalry continued. But at any rate, we had a lot of fun doing those things. And it was, it was not all doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. We were enjoying ourselves, even though there, we weren't dating and going to San Francisco. There were no cars, no gas. <laughs> and there was a hand, was that Babs, or did you want to add something? Well, I, I remember asking a, a stepdaughter of mine who had gone to Stanford and graduated in 72. And I said, what would you be interested in hearing? And uh, she said, what did you wear? <laughs> That's <laughs> a good question. Thing. And so just to 
fill you in, we couldn't wear uh, jeans past the post office. <laughs> was that true when you all were there too? Yes, yeah, yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Not to class, surely. Oh, oh. And not to class, no. And, uh, uh, and we had to worry about slips, which is old fashioned. We um, did have but the other thing she asked was, how did the professors treat you? And that hadn't even occurred to me that there would be any difference at all. Mm -hmm. uh, looking back, you know, uh, we were the majority, the, the women. But I remember a French class. There was a wonderful professor, Lemaitre. Oh, she remember him? Oh, yeah. yeah. And one time after class, or during, I've forgotten how it happened, turned out he invited the, the women in the class, the girls, uh, to wait a minute. And he gave us a little gentle, wonderful talk about sex. Oh. And, and he didn't call it sex, but he said, you just, well, I don't want to t give him, give the lecture, <laughs> but it was, but I just uh, more. Uh, My students uh, more. are taking notes, uh, by more. the way. But it was just something that would never happen in today's world at all. Right. Or, or yeah. even in the 70s. Yeah. Did you feel that, um, so generally those of you, any of you felt that men and women, you know, young men and young women students were treated fairly equally at Stanford? Did you think there were any distinctions in the kinds of things people studied or the way that they were encouraged or discouraged in certain areas? I'd say no. No difference? No difference? Everybody felt well, no difference? I wondered, in science, uh, we were the minority always, mm -hmm. even during mm -hmm. the, the early years. And yeah. uh, so I, I didn't know whether we, we weren't a threat at that point it, uh, at all, because yeah, there weren't very yeah. many of us who were going the science route. Jean, when you were here, did you feel that male and female students oh, well, were treated the same? It was hard. These fellows were not. Uh, they weren't satisfied with just what was in the syllabus or what was assigned. They went to the law library. I remember a political science class and I was the only girl in the section. Mistake. Anyway, the professor would look out and he would look around and he'd look at me and he'd say, I don't think Miss Rogers knows the answer to that question. And I would be well prepared and I had read everything and I was ready to give my answer and he'd pass me. Then, of course, the day that I wasn't prepared was the day he asked me. <laughs> I didn't do very well in that class because he liked talking to these fellows and they all went to the law library and studied all the cases that were in, you know, the, the, the bottom of the page. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that. I was going to do what was required of me, but I was certainly not intent on being a lawyer and I was taking poli sci. <laughs> Mm. Anyway, it was hard, yeah. and the men and the professors said they had to work harder than they had ever worked, mm. because these men demanded it. These are the vets who came back, particularly. I'm sorry. The men who had come back from the war, yes. particularly. Yes. And it, were you the person who told me that they were a little older students, those vets coming back when you were here? That yeah, Babs, did you want to say something? Well, I had an interesting conversation with a friend who was a year ahead. Uh, or a year behind, I guess. He, he was a class of 49, but he should have been the class of 44 or 45. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was saying that they all, they, they were just pushing to get through, which he said was the fo most foolish thing he'd ever done in his life because it was so wonderful at Stanford, but they all were doing this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and the other thing he said was that there were, at that point, young men coming in, the, the, the usual, the, 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 the normal time to come to Stanford, and that they were getting an amazing, unexpected education from the older, from the returned veterans. Marie, did you want to add something? I, I was going to say, um, I had the unusual experience of teaching some of the returning vets mm -hmm. during my fifth year. I was getting my credential and my master's in education, and I was asked to teach a couple of sections in the Romantic Language Department, which was quite a, an honor. And I was thrilled until the day I had to walk into that room 
where I had stood and sat as a student all those years and suddenly I was the one on the platform and I looked out at all these cute guys who had returned from the service and I could not make eye contact that first day. <laughs> uh, but as it turned out, it was a wonderful experience, and they were very serious. So it's so serious that they asked for extra coaching, and during midterms and finals, ten or twelve of them would come up to the residence where I was for extra teaching, and uh, my friends would look with such jealousy as I closed the door. <laughs> you, you had your fan club, I see. No. Well, this, I, yes, go ahead, Merlon. Well, I was, I was just going to talk about it from a slightly different a aspect. Um, I had fulfilled all my requirements at the end of the, my junior year and had the idea that war was over and the men were coming back and senior year was going to be wonderful. Well, they, Stanford was not too eager to have you keep on, staying on, and... Um, I received a letter at the end of fall quarter that I had completed all my requirements and there were many people wanting to come in. And um, I did stay on until winter, the end of winter quarter, but I probably missed the best year of my spring of my life by leaving spring quarter uh, early. I mean, I left early before graduation because I had it completed. Stanford had many, many men returning who they wanted to give space to. Mm -hmm. And I was a good student, too. I was a Phi Beta Kappa, but they, they were not so interested in that anymore. <laughs> well, this brings up also a question that we didn't really cover about when fewer men were at Stanford because of the war, when, or as you were telling me before, some of them were on campus but pushing to get through faster so that they could get out there and serve. Um, it seems that women took more leadership positions on campus. Is that correct during those early years of the war and the mid-years of the war? Was that something you, so Marie? Say that again. It seemed that women students took more leadership positions oh. on campus during the early and middle yeah. years of the oh, war. Is that what, something you all experienced? Certainly the also, editor of the, uh, of the Daily. The editor of the there Daily for the first time was a woman? Editors of the Daily. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you were saying, Janet? I was saying that in relation to what Merlon was talking about, a lot of us uh, were anxious, not only the men, but the women, to leave the university mm -hmm. and get involved with our further careers. Mm -hmm. A lot of us were uh, engaged. Mm -hmm. And so most of us took extra units and went through summer school. Oh. For example, I graduated New Year's Eve 1943. It should have been June of 44. So you weren't so the only. So quite you know, a few women, not only the men, but sped the women. Up there. Sped yeah. up there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you were the first female president of the student government. Yes. There was the first woman who was the editor of the Daily and the editor of the Quad during the war. For those of you who came after the war, did women's leadership on campus continue, or did you feel that we make way for the returning vets, or were those soldier, for, for, former soldiers so busy catching up with their education that it evened out? Do you have a sense, either um, Babs or Jean? Well, um, I, think, I think it began to revert back to mm -hmm. the way it was before. I know the uh, vice president of the student body, I thought was the highest level allowed. Allowed for women, you mean? And, or maybe it was just custom by then. Oh. And the men, the men were the were the uh, presidents mm -hmm. of the student body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it never. I ran for vice president of the student body and lost. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Jean, when you were here post-war. Did it feel normal that this is what college is supposed to be like, or did you really sense, you know, it's really... I'm, sorry, not hearing your, I'm not hearing you very well, I'm sorry. When you were here after the war, yeah. did it feel like normal college life, or just talk a little bit about what campus life was like when you were here? Oh, yes. Well, well campus life was great. You know, the boys left, but the men came home. <laughs> <laughs> And the average age of my freshman class was 21. And for this 18-year-old, that was kind of a, a shock. 
but we had a registration that went on all day long from History Corner almost to Geology Corner because Stanford had a program if you had ever been accepted or had ever attended, you just appeared. So they had no idea how many students were going to be returning. And that was a real blow. They filled classes up so fast that we were all changing our registration. Every time somebody would say, I'll go down and check the board, they'd come back and say, this is closed, that's closed, that's closed. They had classes at night that first quarter because they just couldn't accommodate everyone. Well, we also made a lot of good friends you know, when you're sitting all day long, you know, on the, <laughs> on, the, on the Stanford Quad along that lovely avenue. And somebody would say, I'm hungry. And everybody would say, me too, me too, me too, and <laughs> save my place, and I'll go get us something to eat. And uh, I remember there was a very nice fellow standing behind me, and I had very long blonde hair. Every time I turned my head, he got a mouthful of hair. <laughs> we became very good friends. I'd see him on the campus high. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was a very good time. And uh, I don't know, do you want me to continue along this vein? Well, is there... You have some other questions. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm open to hearing what the, what the campus was like when the male students returned, social life, leadership on campus, or anything else, and I'm just trying to give the, the, the younger end of the table a chance to fill us in a little bit more. If there's anything that you would like to add, either well, Babs or Jean. I agree that uh, I did uh, go out with a, a veteran for a while, and uh, he, he didn't talk about the war at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I think about it, I really know very little about his war experience. He did invite me to come up to San Francisco to meet some of his buddies. And uh, I still remember standing around in, in some apartment with probably four or five other couples. And each of us getting, being given a shot glass. And then it was filled up. And I remember standing with this glass in front of me, and the woman next to me finally said, when I hadn't done anything, just drink up, honey. <laughs> <laughs> so you definitely got an education so at Stanford. <laughs> anyway, it was a different world. It was. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure it's all that said. different. Well, but I recall. <laughs> <laughs> I think they just have more I recall shots. Recall that we began to look at the third finger left hand ah. because a lot of these men were married. Mm -hmm. My lab partner was a delightful fellow. Uh, this is biology one, oh one or something. And I kept thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have a cup of coffee at the cellar with this fellow? Until he said, my wife. And I thought, oops, and a lot of these fellows took their rings off, but you could tell it was suntanned around where the rings were. <laughs> so all of the girls, you know, I'm 18, all the girls, you know, are looking, watching these fellows very carefully. Yeah. But so many of the young women that were married to them got jobs in Palo Alto and were supporting mm -hmm. these fellows and helping them. I remember one fellow asked me to have a cup of coffee, and I got up to the window and I said, oh, could I have a glass of orange juice instead? And he said, oh, he said, how much is that? And I said, oh, I think it's 20 cents. And he said, that works. I've got 65 cents until next week mm -hmm. when I get my GI Bill payment. Mm -hmm. And he was willing to share his last 65 cents oh, with me. Yeah. So they were really on a budget and, uh, you know, nobody, no cars. It floored me coming in today. We couldn't find a place to park. There were no cars. Everybody was on a bicycle. And I remember I had a roommate who would take her bicycle down, say, to History Corner. Then my class is over. I'd take the bike over to the gym, and then I'd take it back somewhere. We had an arrangement, so we were all riding bikes at that time. Mm -hmm. okay. Merlon? Well, you know, something that just I'm remembering right now that probably you younger women will never believe. But when we came to Stanford, every quarter, the university published something called the ball out. Yes. <laughs> and it had your name, your address, the, uh, this is the town from which you came and the address, your current address, and your grade average. <laughs> and this was open knowledge for anybody. They could look it up and think, oh, she's 
she's too smart for me, or oh, what a dumbbell. <laughs> they just looked you right up. The only thing they didn't have was height and weight. <laughs> it was an early Facebook. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's an early Facebook. Yeah. Now, I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to shift us to the post-war period and your lives over the decades, but I just want to see if there's anything else, and more can come out when we do the audience questions, too, but anything else about the 40s, anything else about the early war, during the war, when the men came, more men came back to campus that we haven't touched on that you had hoped we would? Marie? Well, uh, there was one memory. Um, my younger brother, one of my younger brothers, returned from the Navy, and he was at uh, Encina. And uh, one night, one enterprising young man said, let's go to Robley and have a panty raid. Well, he <laughs> gathered quite a few people, and they went over, Charles went, Charles went along, and when they got to Robley, they were outside the windows on one side, and the girls inside were thrilled. They were opening the windows and throwing unmentionables out. <laughs> then one of them helped them all get inside. And when they were inside, Charles said, he said, we didn't know what to do. We just sort of milled around a while and left. And he said, there was one girl who was heard to say, this is the most exciting night of my life. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the man who led that raid was William Rehnquist. <laughs> you know, one thing we haven't talked about before we move on, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but it was during the war that sororities were abolished at Stanford, correct? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure when they were reinstated, but not during your time. There were no sororities when you got here. Is that true, Jean? No, there were... There were no sororities for your... There were your... no sororities um, in 1944. They were yeah. abolished they were in 1944. Yeah, yeah. And and, it but it seems... That... So the, one of the big issues of, of, of the freshman spring quarter was where you're going to live for freshman women. Now, at the time, Robley yeah. housed all women, correct? Could women yes. live in other dorms? It was all oh, women yeah. then. Other than Robley, women could live elsewhere too. No, freshmen. No, women there was all, lived in Robley. all freshmen was all women freshmen were in Robley. Women. Uh huh. Yeah. And what happened when there were no sororities? Where did you Where did you live? We drew. Uh, well, that was. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, depending on your number, you you yeah. could go where you wanted to go. So, so a lot of people ended up in Lagunita, which is where I li yeah. uh, lived. Um, some people were other women's went to Union. Same. And could women live off campus? What? Could women live off campus? No. 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 Could men live off campus? I don't know. We don't know. No. Okay. We lived yeah. in, lived at the village. And some the of us, village, some right. of us wound up at Branner because out of 300 numbers, mm -hmm. let's say I got 295. So I had to go to the freshman dorm. Ah. That was not a happy okay. occasion for we sophomores. I mean, so, we but, thought we should have more late leaves and have, you know, a little more freedom. But living at Branner was fine, except that, you know, we had to abide by all the freshman standards. So that was a little difficult. Did, then I drew again, and I wound up in Lagunita, which was just fine. And then finally, the senior year, you could live wherever there was space open. They finally, you know, yeah. let me go to Lathrop, which Did, had been... Were there um, curfews for female oh. students? Curfews? Sorry? Were there yes. curfews? Yes, oh, indeed. Were there curfews for male students? Oh, gosh, curfews. yes, there were curfews. But what do we have? Not um, for males. But only I for think female the students? The weekend was, was 12 o'clock, and then we had a couple of uh, 1.30s, and I think there were a couple of 2 o'clocks if you were in San Francisco. Uh -huh. And, uh, you, you know, you really had to get home in time yeah. because if you had a lockout, then you were really in trouble, and you had to bang on the door, and somebody had to come and let you in. At Lathrop House, uh, which was the old Chi Omega house, we had keys. And I remember that my jacket was stolen at one of the parties somewhere, maybe at Rosati's. Do any of you remember Rosati's? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, of course, I lost my key. Well, I had to pay for all the keys for the rest of the girls and have the lock changed and all that. Yeah. So that yeah. was something you didn't really like to do. <laughs> it was yeah. expensive. So. There was a hotel in San Francisco that was 
uh, allowed for women students who felt that they missed the last train back to Palo Alto. The Stewart. The, yes. the Stewart Hotel. Yes. Stewart Hotel. Uh -huh. yeah. And they could stay there. Now, was, I'm going to move us out of uh, college, post-college, and uh, one of the questions I <clears throat> wanted to raise was in telling us about the rest of your lives after Stanford, do you Is think there that... a life after Stanford? <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're all here, right? Um, do you think that being at Stanford during, particularly those of you who were during the war years, but during the 1940s, which was an era of new opportunities for women in the military, in war industries, in service, uh, in education, do you think that being here in that decade influence your future lives in any way, or do you think, no, this is what I thought it would be like, this is how it turned out. Um, and I just open it up to anybody who has thoughts on that question of how being at Stanford in the 40s did or didn't influence the rest of your life. Any takers? <laughs> it seems to me that being here during the war years, uh, the women on campus, as you mentioned, had more responsibilities and were able to uh, enjoy more leadership positions so that I think it gave us more confidence perhaps in ourselves and as we went on I worked in Washington DC a year and so I think it was a value to us in that way that's my only comment do others feel that way or you you can disagree too Merlon well I I don't think that it that the war affected me particularly as far as my ambition was concerned and what have you I Immediately upon leaving college, I, uh, I was an international economics major and I got a job in an import-export company right away. That was no problem. And, um, and then like most women in my generation, unless you were going to be a doctor or a lawyer, you usually stop your education on graduating and getting a BA. And then of course, uh, after two years, I got married, and I raised three sons. And I have worked all my life, but I have not, I've been a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And I did learn that at Stanford, that if, if you're given a lot, you pay back. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I did spend I, all kinds of things. I was a docent at the... Oakland Museum for 15 years. I was on the board of Children's Hospital in Oakland. I was on the Landmarks Commission of the city of Orinda, chairman of it, and um, I did lots of things as Janet and I both had national offices with the Garden Club of America involved with conservation and beautification of our country. Uh, you know, that's the way I spent my life besides mm -hmm. my family. Marie, did you want to answer that? Uh, well, with me, I taught Spanish for seven years at Akalani's High School in Lafayette, and I loved it. I think I was the happiest teacher there. But I married at that point, and it was not unusual just to quit your jobs and stay home. That wasn't bad at all. Uh, later <laughs> on, I... Um, I just lived a life that most of us had in those days and some volunteer work and so on. But then I think having been at Stanford, it made me aware of, of looking for opportunities to do other things. We had a tragedy in our family and I knew I had to do something to change my, my thoughts to another field. And um, I started writing. And this was about 25 years ago. And I suddenly decided that I had found my joy. Mm. And this was never anything I did at Stanford, but I felt that it, it laid me open to it. And so I, um, I did have a book published last year, A Mystery. And um, I have quite a few more at home in the drawer if you want to come and look. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but then, uh, for the fun of it, I started uh, uh, sending articles to local news, to San Francisco and Bay Area newspapers like the Chronicle and the Examiner and, and uh, the Almanac here. And, 
the Contra Costa Times. And I had quite a few published. And all of this has really brought a great sense of fulfillment and joy to me. Debs? I got interested in writing, too, but not, not uh, until about 15 years ago. And uh, I joined a writing group, and we're writing memoirs for our grandchildren. And I'm finding it absolutely fascinating um, to, to do that. I worked uh, for a short time, really, as in the medical field. And it was a wonderful period uh, in my life. We had a paper out of it. We got a paper out of it that I, my wonderful senior um, gave me the option of giving the paper, and I accepted. So that was that was exciting. And then after that, I started a career exploration program in San Francisco that is still going on very successfully. And after that, I, I uh, was uh, director of a Project READ, which was a, an adult literacy program for English-speaking adults through the public library. The library has been my ongoing interest mm -hmm. over the years. So a lot of it was volunteer work. Some of it was paid. I got paid twice. <laughs> and uh, it hasn't been very wonderful, really. As far as, oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's been wonderful, but it hasn't been Remarkable. We might beg to differ, but uh, Jean, how about your life after Stanford? I'm sorry. Tell us about your life after Stanford. Oh, life after Stanford, as I said. Hmm. Well, I married the veteran, and uh, <laughs> and we uh, uh, moved to the country. I grew up in Brentwood, Southern California area, and then moved to Brentwood, Eastern Contra Costa, where we farm. And uh, we've raised two children, and it's been a wonderful life. I taught school and, of course, sang and danced in the Follies and, uh, for the hospital. And uh, then uh, decided it was time to go back to school because I'd always wanted to, to be in design. And uh, so I went to Rudolph Schaefer School in San Francisco, uh, School of Design. And, uh, after commuting the 60 miles in and 60 miles home, uh, got my degree and had a design, uh, interior design business for 30 years, from which I just retired a couple of years ago, which was very interesting, but my husband never decided to retire on what I made. He was delighted I was enjoying it, but uh, it was it, very interesting but uh, not as profitable maybe as uh, some of the San Francisco designers. However, it's been a very good life and we've always enjoyed our connection with Stanford. As someone who studies the history of women's movements, I have to ask you this question. How did you react when a next generation, say my generation, came along and began to become politicized as feminists and call for more rights for women and better wages for women and more opportunities and the lifting of quotas on medical school, law school, et cetera. Um, did you feel like uh, you were in support or in conflict? Uh, this may be your daughter's generation for all I know or the other younger women you knew. Um, or did you feel like we did that in the 40s, you know, we've been there. Did, and do any of you um, have a response to what you felt about the revival of the women's movement uh, in the 60s and 70s and afterwards? Janet? I felt that they, were, they needed that and it was a very good uh, development. Mm -hmm. The only thing I felt personally as a member of Cap and Gown when I went to some of their uh, reunions, everyone was studying to be a an attorney or a doctor, and then they'd say, and what do you do with your spare time? <laughs> and what have you done since you've graduated? And all I could say is, well, I do a lot of volunteer work. Mm -hmm. It saves my community some money, mm -hmm. so perhaps I'm contributing a mm -hmm. little bit too. I did work in Washington, D.C. for a year, and I was an assistant to Dr. Stewart here in the mm -hmm. poli -sci department. Mm -hmm. So I, I had a little bit of short career before being a mother. Mm -hmm. But in my family, two sons, one granddaughter and a daughter-in-law all went to Stanford. So. <laughs> So maybe that 
that's that, a success. Uh, feeling came <laughs> through. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts on that question? Well, I, I would say that um, I don't know if, whether at the time of the 60s and 70s that I appreciated what was going on. Mm -hmm. But I think, look, in retrospect, it would have been wonderful. In my case, I was a uh, medical, uh, I was in med school, finished two years, and then the, I had married and, and my children came along. And I retired and planned to go back, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think really it just seemed too much somehow mm -hmm. at that time. And, and now, it's nothing. I mean, these wonderful women who, who have a career and children and a family, we have them in our own family now. And it's really exciting, I think, mm -hmm. what's, yeah. what uh, this has, has, has done right. for women. Any others, well, Jean? I never felt there was anything that I couldn't do if I set my mind to it, because that was my upbringing. Mm -hmm. uh, don't ever, you know, say no, try. And uh, are you afraid of failure? I mean, you could learn from that. You try again. So I had a very positive upbringing, and I never had anyone tell me or any man in the family tell me that I couldn't achieve something. So I think the women, uh, my, like my daughter's generation, very difficult time. Because, you know, we could be a nurse or a teacher. Well, I want to be a nurse. I mean, those people get sick. <laughs> so give me the children, and that will be wonderful. And uh, so, you know, we didn't have that many options. I think we had, in the house, we had maybe two girls that were going to business school. We had a couple that were going to law school. And one was an industrial engineer. Maya was impressed by that. But in order to have a family and a career and do all those things, it, it was incredible, you know. And I think young women today mm -hmm. have a terrible responsibility. Well, you lead me into the last formal question before we open up to the audience, which I gave everyone warning. If anyone <coughs> has any advice for the students who are here from this generation, Stanford students, and you've started us off by saying, don't be afraid about failing. Would anybody add to that, or would you add to that advice for this generation? Well, I thought a lot about that question. And um, the thing that I, for myself, I, you, I would suggest that you, may, you have a major, and you have to learn and memorize a lot of facts and this is going to be something that's going to be your livelihood. <clears throat> in my case, um, I never really used my uh, economics, my education in any way, but I do know that what I did learn became antiquated in a very short time. And even 45 years ago, if I tried to get a job as an economist, I mean, the laws, the governments had changed, the means of passing money around, everything is different. So that was really worthless. But don't forget your subjects that you can take that are not in your major. I remember I took five courses from Jan Popper in um, the appreciation of music. I took Margaret Bailey's great course in Shakespeare. I took Cummings's course in the English poets. Those are the things that have enhanced and enriched my life, not my economics. <laughs> I think that's a plug for the humanities. <laughs> yes. Well, I just mean. You know, your yeah. major subject sure. is your memorization yeah. and all that. Any other advice before we open up to questions? I think uh, the point that was made about don't be afraid to fail is a very good one. It's difficult to be in a university of this caliber and once mm. in a while find that it's overwhelming. 
but don't worry. In other words, there was an article I just read the other day about entrepreneurs, and I think Silicon Valley has that as a point. In other words, in this country, if you don't make it, you can turn around and uh, proceed. So don't be afraid of that. And secondly, I think Merlon has a very good idea. One of my favorite, I was a poli-sci major in international relations. But my favorite course was lectures in architecture. So. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we open up to questions? Are we ready? OK. I think that we have a roving microphone. And if there are any, well, we have two roving microphones. So raise your hand high and um, I'll try to point to the mic t towards you if they don't see you. There's another in the front when you're done, yeah. Sir? Uh, and then we'll go back here. I'd like to express my thanks and admiration to the panel for uh, an incredibly upbeat and positive view on your life's history and on your time during the war. My question comes out of the fact that, of course, the war was a terrible time also. And for all of you, both those who were at Stanford during the war and those who were in school still, uh, friends, family were wounded, killed, captured. And I wonder if those who would like to do so could comment on how you dealt with those emotions and those pieces of news during the war years and whether you, emer whether you here on the home front emerged from the war with some level of hatred of uh, the Germans and the Japanese and how you dealt with that if you had to deal with it in the years after the war. Would anybody like to respond? Did you all get the question? Could you repeat it? Yes, so um, the question if I could summarize really has to do with the dark side and the hardship, mm -hmm. the losses and death, captivity, um, the, the the fears and hatreds for the enemy, how did you deal with the losses or the fears or after the war, the residue of those? Did any of you want to speak to that? Oh my. It's a hard question to answer publicly, yes. but um, is there anybody who has any thoughts about dealing with both the the hardships? I know you all spoke about the fears in the early part of the war, many of you did, but any, any takers? Well, I Abs? jump in. Um, growing up in Southern California uh, with Pearl Harbor, and, and shortly afterwards, I guess, I remember going home one time and realizing that all the gardeners had disappeared. Mm -hmm. And they were all Japanese. Mm -hmm. And I had an aunt who taught school in Mountain View, who had taught uh, some of the families that were uh, taken, taken, I can't think of the right word, taken to away. To the internment? And um, she was just furious, absolutely. She, remember she came down for Christmas that year and, and was just outraged by it. So I think unless you're very close to, close to that aspect, it was hard to really understand what was going on, how, mm -hmm. how unfair and un I remember, excuse me, no, I remember that uh, when the Japanese left our high school, our grade point average went down. And uh, I remember weeping because Bryce Nishimura, who was in the journalism class, was leaving. We didn't know why. Why is he leaving? Where is he going? Then we all hugged him and said goodbye. And, there, and, you know, there were times when then the Japanese came back. Uh, in 40, I guess, 46, um, the Japanese returned. But they were very separate from the rest of us. We had all been kind of friends, and they, they were very much over here, you know, in, a, in their own world. And we weren't collaborating any longer. And that was hard to understand. You know, that was One thing that, that always am, it amazes me is that I don't think that any of us at, at Stanford had any idea what the Nazis were doing to the Jews in Germany. I, I don't think that it was common knowledge. I really don't. We didn't discuss it among ourselves. 
certainly we didn't have it in our classes. I'm wondering why, but in, I just don't think we knew what was going on in Europe. I want to just go back to something that was said earlier in response to about the vets who came back and did not talk about the war. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very, it was a very telling memory in terms of the gentleman's question. Um, that it was probably hard to talk about some of the losses and the pain uh, at that time. Should we go to the question in the back? Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I was a Tridelt in undergrad and graduated in 05, and there's a lot of rumors that went around about why uh, the sororities were abolished in the 40s, so I would love to hear a little bit more about what happened from those of you who were there during that time period. It's the sororities question. Why were sororities abolished yeah. during World War II? Does anyone want to do the short answer to that? Well, I'll try. Janet? There were nine sororities and about 15 fraternities. When sororities first came on campus, of course, first of all, we had 500 women, then we had 1,000 women, then it, of course, grew to 1,500. There wasn't room for the girls who wished to be in sororities to join them. And it was not, it really wasn't fair. Soror other sororities other than R9 wished to come on campus and expand the choices, but it was the war. No buildings could be built. There was no way to uh, encourage people to come uh, to have what they have now, which is meeting off campus. Mm -hmm. Some sororities do that. So there was no solution to the problem, and it was really unfair, and I think Dean Mary Yost was a dean of women mm -hmm. decided that at this period and after the war probably it would take a while too if more sororities wished to come to build the houses mm -hmm. so it was decided to abolish sororities and i'm just going to add i was not here but one of my students some years ago wrote a paper on this that um, was published in our history journal and i believe in the stanford historical i think it won the stanford historical prize that year about the abolition of sororities at stanford and one of the things I learned from that is that there was a criticism of fraternities and sororities for being non-democratic. That is, there was a lot of talk, especially during the war and the defense of democracy, that should we really have a system that's so selective? And as you point out, especially when more and more female students were not being able to get into sororities. Well, the fraternity question kind of became moot with the war and there were fewer men, but the sorority question was ripe for this is a good opportunity to get rid of this system. And then, of course, it would be a long time before it was reestablished. So I hope that begins to answer, and if you want to see me for the citation, I'll give it to you. <laughs> and someone had a hand up towards the front earlier, somewhere in this area. Yes. There's, wait for the microphone so we can hear your question, okay? Uh, my question had to do with the uh, Japanese-American students. Were there Japanese-American students? Were there Japanese-American women? And um, if so, did they disappear from the university? The question is, when the Japanese-American uh, students left during the internment, were the both male and female students who were interned? I'm, I'm not going to answer that explicitly because I don't know, but I do believe that the uh, students at Stanford have changed so much since the 40s. I think that the majority of the students who were here when I was were people who grew up in the Western United States, mm -hmm. and I think uh, we were mainly the better students in the high schools in the Western United States. And I also think that we were, uh, it was really a pretty Caucasian campus. There were not many people of color here. And I think that um, people were fairly prosperous. It is so different from now when it is a universal school where kids come from all over the world. And, um, but it was, it was a much more, it was quite a different time then. The, the student body was very homogeneous, mm -hmm. let me put it that way. And in answer to your question, if there were female or male Japanese American students, both would have been interned. 
even those who were citizens um, who had been interned, yeah. And in the far back again, I think there was a question. I have a comment and a question for Mrs. Morris. Uh, one, you should never downplay the role you played as a pilot patrolling the coasts in 1942 and 43. Most history books talk about the two shelling events that you talked about in Oregon and Washington. Very few talk about the fact that Japanese submarines were patrolling the coast in 1942 and early 43. They sank at least two ships off the California-Oregon coast, and in the winter of 1942, a submarine surfaced off the mouth of the Columbia River, assembled a small seaplane, flew 90 miles inland, and dropped incendiary bombs on the forests. Now, the idea was to set large forest fires. Uh, they forgot that the forests are all wet in the winter, <laughs> so it didn't work. <laughs> that did lead to a 1945 oh. attack that very few history books talk about. It was very important work that you did. The other Sir. question I have is, I, I grew up in the southeast. I wish I'd been able to attend Stanford, but where I grew up, we didn't even know Stanford existed. <laughs> uh, if you're interested, I have an article about the, with me uh, about the sub uh, 12 miles north of Santa Barbara. If you're curious about it, I'd be happy to yeah. give it to you after. I'd appreciate it, but I probably have it, but I would appreciate it. But the question I have is, uh, in the southeast and in the, in the Midwest, many campuses that had a large women contingent during World War II had a lot of activity where the women did, in fact, go and join the wax and in the waves. How much activity was there really on the Stanford campus for women joining the wax and the waves? I think we did mention on the panel that there were just a few from Stanford that we knew of who joined the military. Did anyone want to add to that? There was a group of wax on campus. Yeah. We would see them. You there know. were wax on campus, but we don't know about. And I know of two personal friends who joined the waves, mm -hmm. right? But that's yeah. only two. <laughs> one more question. And there is one in the very front row. Just let her bring the microphone so that we'll all hear you, okay? The wave you were speaking of was Elizabeth Crandall. She was uh, head of Robe of Lagunita. And she uh, raised, you know, went quite high in the ranks. She was a commander. Mm -hmm. And also Barbara Sadler and Rosemary Bauer were both in the waves. So did, was ever, did you hear the answer back there? The names of some of the women, one of whom became a commander in the waves who were here yes, at the time. Was, yes. And I know that you just said the last question, but may I just have the privilege of the chair? Are there any students from my class who are waiting to ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> this is your last chance. No? OK. Well, we promised you all an interesting, informative, and entertaining program. And I think that our group of women have provided that and more. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think, I think that this group of graduates of Stanford University are a great advertisement for the value of a Stanford education. I mean, it's just remarkable to hear your stories and your thoughts, not only on Stanford then, but on what's going on today. So we really appreciated your participating in this. Um, if you are interested in learning about membership in or upcoming programs for either the Stanford Historical Society or the Stanford Alumni Association. Go to their respective websites, poke around on them, and you will learn all about both of those topics. Um, also check out Facebook and Twitter uh, and follow us on those. And if I could just put in a plug for one of my favorite programs, something near and dear to my heart, when you go to the Stanford Alumni Association website, and if you've never done so, check out their travel study program. <laughs> um, there are on the table outside copies of this book, and they are 
uh, complimentary, so if you would like to have one of these, please feel free to help yourself to it. And finally, as soon as I stop talking, everybody here is invited to join us for a reception just outside. So again, panelists and Professor Friedman, thank you so much for this afternoon's program. Pers one person here who could sum up this day that was fun. Jean, please. The last word. <laughs> well, this came out of the preliminary um, show on the road. <laughs> um, I, was, I was asked about some of the social life, and uh, I mentioned that I had, uh, at one of the jolly ups, the dances, uh, when we were freshmen, uh, a young man came up. I'm five foot ten, and a young man came up to me that was very tall. He must have been about six foot four, and asked me to dance. And he was delightful, and we had a good time. And he said, "Oh, there's another open house going to be at Laganita. How about going? I'll meet you there." And I said, "Oh, that'll be fine." So we began to go dancing and having a good time. I went right down to Palo Alto and bought a pair of three-inch heels. And uh, <laughs> first time I'd ever had three-inch heels. Anyway, uh, we had a good time, and the ball out came. And the ball out also told your marital status. And the girls came running down the hall and said, he's married. <laughs> I said, oh, no, that's not fair. I said, I'm 18, and he was a veteran returning. So uh, when I talked to him, I said, I think we need to talk. <laughs> so we ended that. So what do you do? You go home. Or you go back to the dorm and you write a song. And here it is. It's dedicated to the post-war Stanford Ruff. It had to be you. It had to be you. You smoke on the quad. You ain't seen like log. You're not a wheel but a cog. You don't go to games, sing Stanford refrains. You're not in the swim and your hair is getting thin. But I love you the same. You've got a wife in L.A., <laughs> but she's far away. And as long as she's gone, we can't go wrong. We'll break up in May. <laughs> and though you're just 31, we get along, dear. We have such fun. It had to be you, wonderful you. It had to be you. <laughs> And we are adjourned to the reception. <laughs> For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.